the apple tree. The apple tree, the singing, and the gold. Maurice Hippolytus of Euripides. In their silver wedding day of Ashist and his wife were motoring along the outskirts of the moor, intending to crown the festival by stopping the night at Torquay, where they had first met. This was the idea of Stella Ashist, whose character contained a streak of sentiment. If she had long lost the blue-eyed, flower-like charm, the cool slim purity of face and form, the apple blossom colouring, which has so swiftly been and so oddly affected ashes twenty six years ago. She was still at forty three, a commonly and faithful companion, whose cheeks were faintly mottled, and whose grey blue eyes had acquired a certain fullness. It was she had stopped the car between car where the common rose steeply to the left, and a narrow strip of larch and beach, with here and there a pine stretched out towards the valley between the road and the first long high hill of the full moor. She was looking for a place where they might lunch, for ashes never looked for anything, and this between the golden firs and the feathery green larches smelling of lemons in the last sun of April this, with a view into the deep valley and up to the long moor heights, seemed fitting to the decisive nature of one who sketched in watercolours and loved romantic spots, grasping the paint box she got out. What this do, Frank? Ashes, rather like a bearded shuller, grey in the wings, tall, long-legged, large remote grey eyes which sometimes filled with meaning and become became almost beautiful with those nose a little to one side and bearded lips just open ashes 48 and silent grasped the luncheon bo basket and put out too oh look frank a grave by the side of the road where the track from the top Top of the common crossed it at right angles and ran through a gate past the narrow wood. It was a thin mound of turf, six feet by one, with a moor stone to the west, and on it someone had thrown a blackthorn spray and a handful, handful of bluebells. Ashes looked, and the poet in him moved. At cross rose a suicide's grave, more mortals with their superstitions. Whoever lay there, though, had the best of it. No clammy spulker, sepulchre among their hideous graves carved with futilities, just a rough stone, the wide sky and wayside blessings, and without, without comment. For he had learned not to be a philosopher in the bosom of his family. He strode away up to strode away off onto the common, dropped the luncheon basket under a wall, spread a rug for his wife to sit on he would turn off from her sketching when she was hungry and took from his pocket Morris translation of the Hippoto Hippolytus. He had soon finished reading of the Cyprian and her revenge, and look at the sky instead, and watching the white clouds so bright against the intense blue. Ash ashes on his silver wedding day longed for he knew what he knew not he knew not what, maladjusted to life man's organism. One's mo mode of life might be high and scrupulous but there was always an undercurrent of greediness, a hankering, and sense of waste. Did women have it too? Who could tell? And yet men who gave vent to their appetites for novelty, their riotous longings for new adventures, new risks, new pleasures, these suffered, no doubt, from the reverse side of starvation, 
from surfbeat. No getting out of a out of it maladjusted animal, civilized man. There could be no garden of his choosing of the apple tree, the singing and the gold. In the words of that the lovely Greek chorus, no achievable Elysium in life, or lasting haven of happiness for any man with a sense of beauty, nothing which could compare with the captured loveliness in an arc work of art, set down forever, so that to look on it or read was always to have the same precious sense of exaltation and rest in in a rock in in a variety. Life, no doubt, has moments that quality of beauty, of unbidden flying rapture. But the trouble was they lasted no longer than the span of a cloud's flight over the sun. Impossible to keep them with you, as art caught beauty and held it fast. They were fleeting as one of the glimmering or golden visions. One had the soul and nature, glimpse of its remote and brooding spirit. Here, with the sun hot on his face, a cuckoo calling from a thorn tree, and in the air, the honey savour of gorse, he among the little fronds of the young fern, the starry blackthorn. While the bright clouds drifted by high above the hills and dreamy valleys here, and now was such a glimpse. But in a moment it would pass as the face of Pan, which looks round the corner of a rock, vanishes at your stare. And suddenly he sat up. Surely there was something familiar about this view, this bit of common, that ribbon of road, the old wall behind him. While they were driving, he had not been taking notice, never did, thinking of far things or of nothing but now he saw. Twenty-six years ago, just at this, at this time of year, from the farmhouse within half a mile of this very spot, he had started for that day in Torquay. Whence it might be said it had said it had never returned. And a sudden ache beset his heart. He had stumbled on just one of the one of those past moments in his life, whose beauty and rapture had he had failed to rest, whose wings had fluttered away into the unknown. He had stumbled on a buried memory, a wild sweet time swiftly choked and ended, and turning on his face, he rested his chin on his hands, and stared at the short grass where the little blue milkwort was growing. And this is what he remembered. On the first day, first of May, after their last year, together at college, Frank Ashes and his friend Robert Garton were on the tramp. They had walked that day from Brent, intending to make Shagford, and Ashes' football knee had given out, and according to their map, they had still some seven miles to go. They were sitting on a bank beside the road, with their track across the long side of wood, resting the knee and talking of the universe, as young men will. Both were over six feet and thin as rails, ashes pale, idealistic, full of absence, garden, queer, round the corner, knotted, curly, like some primeval beast. Both had a literary bent, neither for a hat. Ashes' hair was smooth, pale, wavy, and had a way of rising on either side of his brow, as if always being, <clears throat> always being flung back. Carton's was a kind of dark, unfathomed, unfathomed mouth. They had not met a soul for miles. My dear fellow, Carton was saying, it is only an effect of self-consciousness. 
It's a disease of the last 5,000 years. The world was happier without it. Ashes, following the clouds with his eyes, answered, It's the pearl in the oyster, anyway. My dear chap, all our modern unhappiness comes from pity. Look at animals and red Indians, limited to feelings their own occasional misfortunes. Then look at ourselves, never free from feeling the toothaches of others. Let's get back to feelings for nobody and have a better time. You'll never practice that. Garton pensively stirred the hotchpotch of his hair. To attain full growth, one mustn't be squeamish. To starve oneself emotionally is a mistake. All emotion is to the good in riches life. Yes, uh, and when it runs up against chivalry, Ah, oh, that's so English. If you speak of emotion, the English always think you want something physical and, and are shocked. They are afraid of passion, but not of lust. Oh no, so long as they can keep a secret. Astros did not answer. He had plucked a blue floret and was twiddling it against the sky. A cuckoo began calling from a thorn tree. The sky, the flowers, the songs of birds. Robert was talking through his hat, and he said, Well, let's go on and find some farm where we can put up. In uttering those words, he was conscious of a girl coming down from the common just above him. She was outlined against the sky, carrying a basket, and you could see that sky through the crook of her arm. And Ashes, who saw beauty without wondering how it could advantage him, thought, How pretty the wind blowing her dark frieze skirt against her legs. Lifted a battered peacock, Tam Chantal. Her grey greyish blouse was worn and old. Her shoes were split, her little hands rough and red, her neck brown. The dark hair waved untidy across her broad forehead. Her face was short, her upper lip short, showing a glint of teeth. Her brows were straight and dark, her lashes long and dark, her nose straight, but her grey eyes were the wonder dewy, as if opened for the first time that day. She looked at Ashes. Perhaps he struck her as strange, limping along without a hat, with his large eyes on her, and his hair falling back. He could not take off what was not on his head, but put up his hand in a salute and said, "Can you tell us if there's a farm near here where we he, where we could stay the night? I've gone late." Um, there's only our, there's only our farm near, sir. She spoke without shyness, in a pretty soft, crisp voice. And where's that? Down here, sir. Uh, would you put us up? Oh, I think we would. Will you show us the way? Yes, sir. He lim limped on, silent, and got into cop the <coughs> catechism. Are you a De Devonshire girl? No, sir. What then? From Wales. Ah, I thought you were a Celt. No, it's not your... So it's not your farm. My aunt, sir. And your uncle's? He said. Who farms it, then? My aunt and my three cousins. But your uncle was a Devonshire man? Yes, sir. Have you lived here long? Seven years. And how do you like it after Wales? Uh, I don't know, sir. I suppose you don't remember. Oh yes, but it is different. I believe you. Ashes broke in suddenly. How old are you? Seventeen, sir. And what's your name? Megan David. This is Robert Garton, and I am Frank Ashes, 
We want to get on to Chatford. It is a pity your leg is hurting you. Ashes to smile, and when he smiled, his face was rather beautiful. Descending past the narrow wood, they came on the farm suddenly. A long, low stone built dwelling with casement windows in a farmyard where pigs and fowls and an old mare were strained. A short steep up grass, grass hill behind was crowned with a few scotch firs, and in front, an old orchard of apple trees just breaking into flower, stretched down to a stream and a long wild meadow. A little boy with oblique dark eyes was shepherd, shef, shepherding a pig, and by the house door stood a woman who came towards them. The girl said, uh, It is Mrs. Narracombe, my aunt. Mrs. Narracombe, my aunt, had a quick, dark eyes, like a mother wild ducks, and something of a same snaky turn about her neck. We met your niece on the road, said Ashes. She thought you might perhaps put, up, put us up for the night. Mrs. Narracombe, taking them in a and from head to heel, uh, answered, Well, I can, if you don't mind one room, Megan, get the spare room ready and a bowl of cream. You'll be wanting tea, I suppose. Passing through a sort of porch made by two yew trees and some flowering currant bushes, the girl disappeared into the house, her peacock tam shanter bright thoughts that rosy pink and the dark green of the yews. Will you come into the parlour and rest your leg? You'll be from college, perhaps. We were, but we've gone, we've gone down now. Mrs. Narracombe nodded sagely. The parlour, brick floored, floored, with bare table and shiny chairs and sofas stuffed with horsehair, seemed never to have been used, it was so terribly clean. Ashes sat down at once on the sofa, holding his lame knee between his, his hands, and Mrs. Narracombe gazed at, gazed at him. He was the only son of a late professor of chemistry, but people from people found a certain lordiness in one who was often so sublimely unconscious of him. Is there a stream where we could bathe? There's the stream at the bottom of the orchard, but sitting down you'll not be covered. How deep? Well, tis about a foot and a half, maybe. Oh, that'll do fine. Which way? Down the lane, through the second gate on the right, and the, and the pools by the pig apple tree, big apple tree that stands by itself. There's trout there, if you can tickle them. They're more likely to tickle us, Mrs. Narracombe smiled. There'll be the tea ready when you come back. The pool formed by the damming of a rock had a sandy bottom. And the big apple tree, lowest in the orchard, grew so close that its boughs almost overhung the, overhung the water. And it was in it was in leaf, and all but in flower, its crimson buds just bursting. There was not room for more than one at the time in that narrow bar, and Ashes waited his turn, rubbing his knee and gazing at the wild meadow, all rocks and thorn trees and felled flowers with a grove of beeches beyond, raised up on a flat mound. Every bowl was swing, swinging in, in, the wire, in the wind. Every sp spring bird calling and a slanting sunlight dappled the grass. He thought the Theocritus and the river Cherwell of the moon and the maiden with the dewy eyes. 
of so many things that he seemed to think of nothing, and he felt absurdly happy. During a late and sum sumptuous tea with eggs to it, cream and jam, and thin, fresh cakes touched with saffron, garden discounted on the kelp. It was about the period of the Celtic awakening, and the discovery that there was Celtic blood about this family had excited one who believed that he was a Celt himself, sprawling on a horsehair chair, with a handmade cigarette dribbling from the corner of his curly lips. He had been plunging his cold pinpoints of eyes into ashes and praying the refinement of the Welsh. To come out of Wales into England was like the change from China to earthenware. Frank, as a dead Englishman, as D, the Englishman, had not, of course, perce perceived the, perceived the exquisite refinement and emotional capacity of what Welsh girl, and delicately stirring in the dark mat of his still wet, wet hair, he explained how exactly she illustrated the, the writings of the Welsh board Morgan AP something in the 12th century. Ashes full length go full length on the horse hair sofa, and just for beyond its end, smoked a deeply coloured pipe, and did not listen. Thinking of the girl's face when she brought a relay of cakes, it had been exactly like looking at the, at a flower or some other pretty sight in nature till, with a funny little shiver, she had lowered a glance that had gone out, quiet as a mouth. Let's go to the kitchen, said Carton, and some see some more of her. The kitchen was a whitewashed room with rafters, to which were attached smoked hams. There were flower pots on the window sill, and guns hanging on hanging on nails, queer mugs, china and pewter, and portraits of Queen Victoria. A long, narrow table of plain wood was set with bowls and spoons, under a string of high hung onions. Two sheep dogs and three cats lay here and there. On one side of the recessed fireplace sat two small boys, idle and good as gold. On, on the other sat a stout, light-eyed, red-faced youth with hair and lashes the colour of the toe he was running through the barrel of a gun. Between them, Mrs. Narakom dreamily stirred some savoury-scented stew in the large pots. Two other youths, oblique-eyed, dark-haired, rather sly-faced, like the two little boys, were talking together and lolling against the wall. And the girl, Megan, seemed the only active creature drawing cider and passing with jugs from cask to table. Seeing them thus about to eat, Carton said, Ah, oh, if, you, if you'll let us, you will come back when supper's over. And without waiting for an answer, they withdraw again to the parlour. But the colour in the kitchen, the warmth, the scent, and all those faces heightened the bleakness of their shiny room, and they resumed their seats moodily. Regular gypsy type, those, those boys, there was only one Saxon, the fellow cleaning the gun. That girl is a subtle study psych psychologically. Ash's lips twitched. Garton seemed to him an ass just then. Subtle study. She was a wild flower. A creature it did, did you good to look at. Study. Garton went on. 
emotionally, she would be wonderful. She wants awakening. Are you going to awaken her? Garton looked at him and smiled. How coarse in English you are, that curly smile seemed saying. And as she puffed his pipe awakened her, that fool had the best opinion of himself. He threw up the window and leaned out. Dusk had gathered thick. The farm buildings and the wheelhouse were all dim and bluish. The apple trees but a blurred wilderness. The air smelled of wood smoke from the kitchen fire. One bird going to bed later than the others was uttering a half-hearted twitter. As though surprised at the darkness, from the stable came the snuffle and stamp of feeding horse, and away over there was the loom of the moor, and away and away the shy stars which had not as yet full light, pricking white through the deep blue heavens, a quivering owl hooted. Ashes drew a deep breath. What a night to wander out it. A paddling of unshod hoops came up the lane, and three dim, dark shapes passed past ponies on an evening march. Their heads, black and fuzzy, showed above the gate, at the top of his pipe, and a shower of little sparks. They, sh they sh shied around and scampered. A, a bat went fluttering past, uttering its almost inaudible chip-chip. Ashes held out his hand. On the upturned palm, he could feel the dew. Suddenly, up from overhead, he heard little bur burring boys' voices, little thumps of boots thrown down, and other voice, crisp and soft, the girls putting them to bed. No doubt, and nine clear words, No, Rick, you can't have the cat in bed. Then came a skirmish of giggles and gurgles, a soft slap, a laugh so low and pretty that it made him shiver a little. A blowing sound and the glim of the candle which was fingering the dusk above went out. Silence reigned. Ashes withdraw into the room and sat down. His knee pain pained them, and his soul felt gloomy. You go to the kitchen, he said. I'm going to bed. For Ashes, the wheel of slumber was wont to turn noiseless and slick and swift. But though he seemed sunk in sleep, when his companion came up, he was really wide awake, and long after Carton, smothered, smothered in the other bed of that low-roofed room, was worshipping darkness with his upturned nose. He heard the, the owls, barring the discomfort of his knee. It was not unpleasant. The cares of life did not loom large in night's watches for this young man. In fact, he had none, just enrolled a barrister with literary aspirations, the world before him, no father or mother, and four hundred a year of his own. Did it matter when, where he went, what he, what he did, or when he did it? His bed, too, was hard, and this preserved him from fever. He lay sniffing the scent of the night which drifted into the low room through the open casement close to his head, except for a def definite irritation with his friend. Natural when he had tramped with the man for three days, ashes memories and visions had that sleepless, sleepless night were kindly and wistful and exciting. One vision, especially clear and unreasonable, for he had not even been conscious of noting it, was the face of the youth cleaning the, cleaning the gun. 
its in intent, stolid, yet startled up, yet started up look, and kitchen doorway, quickly shifted to the girl carrying the cider jug. This red, this red, blue-eyed, light-lashed, tall-haired face stuck as firmly in his memory as the girl's own face. So dewy and simple, but at last, in the square of darkness through the up uncertain casement, he saw day coming and heard one horse and sleepy cow. And, and then followed silence, dead as ever, to the song of a blackbird, not properly awake, ventured into the hush. And from starting at the frame brightening light, ashes fell asleep.